Hello and welcome to week 8 of the Bible Story in 90 Days. Let's go ahead and begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we praise you and thank you for your gifts and your blessings to us. We especially thank you for, uh, for the gift of this journey through sacred scripture. We pray that you would continue to be with us and to bless us. Uh, help us to know your presence and guide us in this study. We ask these things, Father, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to begin with a little review of where we've come and what we've looked at so far. So uh, we began by looking at the early world and the patriarchs in the book of Genesis, and then the time in Egypt and the Exodus, which we read about in the book of Exodus. Um, the book of Leviticus goes along at the same time. That was um, the laws given on Mount Sinai uh, at, regarding the um, uh, regarding the, the temple sacrifice and the, the things that the Levites needed to know. Then the, the desert wanderings, which we read about in the book of Numbers, and the book of Deuteronomy takes place at the same time as the book of, of Numbers. Deuteronomy is uh, Moses' last will and testament. Um, then we have the, the time of the conquest as the Israelites enter into the land of Canaan, which we read about in the book of Joshua when they first went in and, and, and conquered the land and got to that point where they had, they had peace. They hadn't driven everybody out, but they had at least peace with the other people who lived there in the land of Canaan. Um, and then the book of Judges, which followed Joshua, and that was the time without, a real, without any real central leadership in Israel um, and so so all of those different peoples and, and the neighbors started attacking again, and God raised up judges to be able to defend them. And the book of Ruth takes place at, at the same time as the book of Judges. Uh, the book of Ruth tells us about Ruth, who is uh, the grandmother to King David that we're going to read about this next week. Um, after the time of the Judges, um, we heard kind of at the end of the, the book of Judges, and what we read about this last week, was the establishment of a kingdom. And Saul was named the first king. And so we read about um, Saul in this time of the United Kingdom in the first book of Samuel. Uh, this next week, we're going to read 2 Samuel, which is what we're going to uh, talk about today. And then um, following that, we'll read 1 Kings. And those three books tell us of this time of the United Kingdom. And the first three kings of Israel, Saul, David, that we read about this week, and then his son, Solomon. Um, the, first, uh, the first three kings. Um, some other books that go along with this time period, uh, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, First and Second Chronicles, they, they kind of tell the story again. And later on, people are just kind of continuing to reflect on the story. And, and so they give kind of a different telling of the story, emphasizing different things, but, but essentially telling the same story as what we're reading about in First and Second Samuel and in, and in First and Second Kings. That'll be in First and Second Chronicles. And then uh, the book of Psalms. Many of the Psalms were written by King David, whom we read about uh, this week. Uh, the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, which are normally attributed to Solomon. Um, a lot of scholars think they were actually written sometime later, but they, they do reflect this, um, the tradition of wisdom that begins with Solomon for sure. Whether, um, whether he wrote parts of it or all of it uh, is hard to say, but it certainly reflects that tradition of wisdom that begins with King Solomon. Um, and so anyway, so those books, First and Second Chronicles, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, go along with this same time period that we're reading about now, this time period of the United Kingdom. And so with that, let's go ahead and uh, kind of jump into the second book of Samuel. Second Samuel focuses on the life of King David. We read in 1 Samuel how God had established a covenant with David. God had already chosen him from his youth. He had rejected Saul, but, but left Saul on the throne. But God had already made it clear to Samuel that, uh, that Saul was not, or that God was not going to establish a dynasty with Saul. 
Um, once he died, uh, his family would not continue to reign. Um, and the God had chosen instead David. And God was going to establish a dynasty with David. God makes a covenant with David that, that his dynasty will last forever. And politically, uh, his, his family does reign uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, for a very long time, up until the time of the Babylonian captivity, uh, which will be kind of the next major turning point in, um, in well, one of the next major turning points in, in uh, the history of Israel. Um, but, uh, so they'll, they'll reign for a long time, but eternally they will reign through Jesus, because Jesus is a descendant of David. Um, and, uh, and the fulfillment of, of that, uh, that promise that God makes to David. David was anointed as a youth. And, you know, we read that story when, uh, in, in 1 Samuel, where Samuel goes and he finds Jesse and, and all of the sons of Jesse, and he looks them all over, and finally God tells him to anoint the youngest one, David. So we heard about him being anointed, but he's not publicly recognized until a long time later. And we're going to read about that in, uh, in the second book of Samuel. It's one of the first things that happens here in the book. David uh, it retells the story of David hearing about Saul's death. And, um, and then uh, after David has a chance to, to kind of mourn, there's, there's a little conflict, but then pretty early on in the book, David is established as the king of all of Israel. Um, but what happens first is um, that Saul's son, Ishbal, was, uh, was crowned king of Israel. He was recognized by, by the people as the... Um, uh, as, as, the, uh, as the next king after Saul. David is recognized just in Judah. And, and you can kind of imagine this happening. You know, in, uh, in the tribe of Judah, uh, well, David had been really popular everywhere. He was Saul's general, but he was most popular with his own people. And David was from the tribe of Judah. And so for David to be able to, to gain support from his own tribe is pretty understandable, and that's what happens. So at first, um, the Judahites will crown David as, as king of Judah. Um, meanwhile, the other 11 tribes recognize Ishbaal as, as their king. And there's this little conflict that goes on for just a few years, but then Ishbaal is killed, and David becomes king of all of Israel. And so the kingdom is once again united now under the kingship of David. And so that's going to happen here just in the, first, uh, in the first few chapters. Once David becomes king of, of Judah, or when he's king of Judah, he establishes a capital, and that is the city of Hebron. Hebron is right in the middle of of, uh, of the land of Judah. And so it makes just a great, a great capital, great stronghold for him. It was a city that was already held by the Judahites, and so David goes there and he makes that his capital. But, um, but after he becomes the king of all of Israel, and the kingdom is again united, he wants a capital that's, more, that's a little more central, and that's, not, that's, that's gonna show that he's not just the king of Judah, but the king of all of Israel. And so he moves his capital. And we read about it in uh, chapter, um, chapter 5. He captures Zion. Zion, you hear about uh, Mount Zion. You hear about uh, Zion as the city of David. Um, it was, it's, so Zion is kind of part of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is at the very northern edge of, of the land of Judah. And, you know, as, as you remember in, in Joshua and in Judges, they, they kind of went in and they conquered a lot of the peoples, but they didn't drive everybody out. They didn't conquer everything. Um, with some people, they just made peace. And they had made peace with the city of Jerusalem, um, which was filled with Jebusites. Uh, they had made peace with the Jebusites, but they had not really taken over the city of Jerusalem. Well, now David wants the city of Jerusalem. He wants that to be his capital. It's this major city. It's very, um, very fortified. It has a big wall around it. Big, great, great capital for the king. And, um, and that's the city where he wants to go to. Um, this is also 
Uh, it also has a great religious significance. If you remember back in uh, the book of uh, Genesis, when Abraham had gone off to, to war and was successful in war, Melchizedek came out and, and he offered sacrifice for, uh, for Abraham. Melchizedek came from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, that's where he had lived. Um, there is um, this strong kind of sense that, that this is a, a special city to God, and so that's where he wants to go. It talks about something in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. It says that as David is, uh, is going to the city of Jerusalem, it says in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 8, On that day David, David said, All who wish to attack the Jebusites must strike at them through the water shaft. Um, and uh, what that's referring to is there in the city of Jerusalem, there is... Um, there's this, you know, it's up in the mountains, and there's this huge, um, well, it's like a, kind of like a spring, but this big um, crack that goes to the ground. The wall around the city was very well fortified, uh, but there's, a, there's kind of a natural spring there in the city, and this place where the water also drains out of the city, and, uh, and that's not known to many people, but David knows about it. And so David and the army, they'll sneak in through the water shaft into the city, and that's how they get in and, and will take over the city, be able to conquer the city, um, rather than you know, laying siege and trying to tear down the wall and break in through the wall. Um, but that's what they do. Um, all right, so in chapter 5, they take over the city of Zion. Oh, and just to explain that a little bit more, um, the city of Jerusalem is built on seven hilltops. So it's up in the mountains. There's kind of seven, seven major hilltops in the city, and one of those is Zion. Um, and that's where David will build his palace at, and that's why it, it's referred to as the city of David. Is um, On Zion, on the, the hill, Mount Zion, is where David will establish his, um, uh, his, his palace. Then in um, chapter 6, we'll hear about the Ark of the Covenant. Now that David has established Jerusalem as his, um, as his capital, he wants God to be there. He wants to be with God. And so he moves the Ark of the Covenant from, um, from where it was into the city, uh, into the city of Zion. Um, continuing to keep a dwelling in a tent. Now, one of the things that, um, that, that people have noticed and, and have talked about is, is, uh, is all of the violence and all of the warfare that's been happening. And, and one of the things that we're going to see here in 2 Samuel is that God kind of pushes back against that. And God is going to... He's, you know, we, we said from the very beginning, God is kind of gradually revealing Himself and gradually teaching people. And so He's not expecting them to, to act with uh, full Christian maturity. But little by little, He's revealing Himself. Little by little, He's revealing how He wants us to live. I, at the same time, just kind of using what's there. And, um, you know, and this, was a, this was a really violent time in world history. Um, people were very violent. There was a lot, of, a lot of war and a lot of fighting and a lot of conflict, and that's, that's the way things were, and that's the kind of people that God is working with. And so he's, he's going to use that somewhat, but he's also wanting to teach them something different. And so, you know, as they, as they first go into the land of Canaan and they establish peace, it's not totally by violence. David, as a king, is, he's pretty violent. I mean, he was the general. He was the army general. And um, when he became king, he kind of ruled by the army um, and continued to, to, to conquer peoples. He expanded the kingdom. He conquered some of the peoples who lived around them um, to, to give them kind of a buffer zone. And God now is David. One of the things David wants to do is David wants to establish a temple. I want to build it. I want like God to be really honored here. And, and that's a great sense of devotion. And, and when the prophet Nathan hears about that, he's like, that's a great idea, David. Um, you know, you've built a palace for yourself. David, you know, builds this big palace for himself. And he says, what? You know, it's not right that I should live in a palace 
while God is living in a tent. If I have a palace, God should have a palace, right? And David just, or Nathan, excuse me, Nathan, the prophet, just kind of recognizes the beauty in that sentiment. But then he comes back and he says, you know what? God said he doesn't want you to build the temple. And you think about all of the people around them and the people around them, they've, they've kind of given in, they've been conquered, but they think of David as the oppressor. Now, not the Israelites, but the Jebusites who had control of Jerusalem and the other Canaanites, they think of David as the conqueror. And that's not the way God wants to be known. Um, that's not what God wants to be associated with. Um, not in, in those people's minds. And so God says, you know what, David? I want, I, I want you to hold off on this. And we're going to wait. And uh, after you die, your son Solomon will reign. And Solomon's going to reign differently. Solomon's not going to reign by the strength of his army. Solomon's going to reign by his wisdom. And that's what I want to be known by. Um, and so the temple is going to be known as the Temple of Solomon. And all of those people, they love Solomon. Um, Solomon's not the one who conquered them. Solomon's the one who brought them prosperity. Uh, they love Solomon, um, even though he's, you know, he's a foreign ruler uh, for, for all of the other Canaanites. He's a foreigner, but he's someone who rules by peace and who rules by wisdom. And they think they got a pretty good deal under Solomon. Um, and and they, they're able to recognize his wisdom. And we're going to see in the first book of Kings that people from all over the world go to hear about Solomon's wisdom. And when they go to hear Solomon's wisdom, they hear about Solomon's God. Um, and so th by, uh, by, by waiting on building the temple, the temple becomes a means of evangelization. Um, and it's, it's not just for the Israelites to be able to be with God, but it's also... For, uh, for all of those other people who will come to hear the wisdom of Solomon, for them to be able to experience God as well. But anyway, but so God has, you know, he's allowed that warfare because that's the way things were done, but he's now kind of moving them beyond that. And he's teaching them that that's, that's not the way he really, he wants it to be. All right, um, and so that's in chapter seven where we'll hear about David um, wanting to build the temple and God asking him to wait a little bit on it. Uh, also, towards the beginning of the second book of Samuel, we'll hear about uh, David having all kinds of wives and concubines. Um, again, you know, this is not God saying that this is the way he wants it to be. This is just David being like other kings. And uh, but one of the things that they did um, in the ancient world, as in the Middle Ages as well, is, um, is they would establish treaties through marriage. And so if David wants to have a treaty with Egypt, maybe the king of Egypt will give um, one of his daughters to, uh, to David to be, to be his wife. And that establishes a family bond then between those two kingdoms um, or with some of the other kingdoms. So David is conquering people. He's also making peace with those people. And each of those wives, they kind of represent a treaty that's going on with some place. They might not have ever been there with David. Um, many of them were, but, um, but they're not necessarily close relationships. They're really political relationships. Um, uh, so anyway, so we read about that here at the beginning of, of 2 Samuel. And, um, and then uh, we're going to read about just David, uh, again, being that warrior king and, uh, and fighting to establish peace, uh, fighting to, to really establish the kingdom, sometimes to reunite the kingdom as little skirmishes arise and, and people decide they don't want to follow David. Uh, even his own son will rise up against him and try to take control of the throne. And so David's going to have to go to war against his own son. Um, uh, and then at the, uh, towards the end of the book, in chapter 24, there's, um, there's this story that seems to us a little bit strange. In chapter 24, David is going to conduct a census. Uh, he's just counting the people. You know, the same thing that, that we do every 10 years, you know, just have a census to find out how many people we got. Um, you know, pretty normal thing. Um, it was done uh, sort of at the beginning of Numbers and at the end of Numbers. We had those two censuses. But here David conducts a census and he gets in trouble for it. 
Um, and the prophet criticizes him, and God even uh, punishes him for conducting this census. And we, we read about that, and we think, why, why would that be? Um, the reason why God doesn't want David to conduct a census is because when David conducts a census, he's saying, these are my people. And they're not his people. They're God's people. Um, and, and, and what God has been wanting is for David to be his spokesman, but for God to be the real king. And God already knew how many people there were. And when God wanted the kingdom of Israel to do something, God already knew if they could do it because God knew the people. God knew them inside and out. God didn't need to conduct a census. Um, when David conducts a census, David is saying, this is how many people I have. Um, and so he's kind of overstepping his bounds as, uh, as the king, or really um, God would see him as like the vice king. Uh, God's the king. David is there to, uh, to be his representative. Um, and so anyway, so that's why uh, David gets in trouble when he conducts that census in chapter 24. Um, and that's going to bring us to, to the, the end of 2 Samuel. Um, and at the end of 2 Samuel, uh, David is, uh, he's still the king. At the beginning of the first book of Kings, which we'll read next week, we're going to hear about the, the death of David. Uh, but by the end of uh, 2 Samuel, David is coming towards the end of his life. Um, and uh, and his, his reign is about done. But, but we're going to see this, um, as you read through it, I think you'll be able to understand the different things that's happening. Um, one of the things that you notice is that David, at times, takes on the role of the priest. And so the priest will sometimes uh, vest him, put the, 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 the uh, sacred vestments on David as David goes to pray. Um, there's been... Uh, for a time, kind of the split between political and religious authority. And so we saw at the time of Moses, you know, where Moses went and he spoke to God face to face, but his brother Aaron was the priest. And, and so that political and religious authority are, are separated. In Saul, that's really clear. Um, Saul is only a political king and he's not the religious leader. And when he goes around Samuel, he gets chastised for that. Um, but, but David is seen as differently. And even the, uh, even the high priest sees David differently. Um, and David has this, this unique and this special relationship with God where he's kind of reuniting those two offices. And so David will, will serve as king, but at times that, that kingship will have a, a priestly role to it. Um, and that is preparing us for Jesus, who is our priest, prophet, and king, really reuniting uh, all three roles in, in one person um, and then uh, calling us to do the same as in baptism. We are, we are anointed as priest, prophet, and king as well. All right, with that, um, we're going to, again, just this week, uh, read through, um, we'll be we finished... Uh, 1 Samuel, and then read 2 Samuel, reading about the story of David. Let us um, entrust all of these things to Our Lady as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just a couple other things for your, your prayers and your attention. Um, this weekend, our youth group, um, a bunch of kids from our youth group are traveling to the Steubenville Conference in Springfield, Missouri. So please pray for them Friday through Monday. And then Wednesday of next week is our patronal feast day, um, the Solemnity of Saints Anne and Joachim. And so we'll have a, a special Mass on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. It'll be a bilingual Mass followed by a reception to celebrate our uh, patronal feast. Invite everyone to join us for that. Thank you very much.